remember that we don't look to him as a prophet. I even asked him, and he said, no, we're not. he's not looked at as a prophet by a majority of Christian scholars. You know, but my question was, why is there a story even like this in this book? You know, what, what benefit do we get morally or educationally out of Lot sleeping with his two daughters? I mean, this, this, this doesn't really make sense why they We could have just had this out of the Gomorrah story and left the rest out. We really need to know all of this information. TMI, you know what I mean? Too much information. So, and I just didn't, it, it's not sitting right with me for some reason that these type of stories would be attributed to people who otherwise are known as honorable and dignified people. Then you can go and see that there's all these other stories. Now, I didn't hear about this in Sunday school. You know, they didn't tell us about Lot getting drunk in church. They didn't tell us about, I mean, Noah getting drunk in church. They didn't tell us about Lot sleeping. You don't hear about these things. So I kept reading because I'm really, I'm really intrigued now. And I told Benjamin I want to go ask my pastor about this. So I'm like, why? He's like, just keep reading. I said, no, I'm going to go ask the pastor. He said, no, no, don't do that. Just keep reading. Keep reading. This is what we're here to do. To find out what it says to us. And you can't do that incompletely. So keep reading. So I kept reading. And I got to two of my favorite stories. For time's sake, I'm going to cut a couple of them off. I got the stories of Lot, I mean, of David and Solomon. Right next to each other. Father and son, Solomon and David. Known as the greatest kings of Israel. The greatest kings of Israel, David and Solomon. And the story of Solomon is that he, you know, he established the Temple Mount, you know, erected uh, the tabernacle, the holies, the holies, and all of these things that he did, and was a great king of Israel, established the dominance of the law of Moses at that time. But there, there's another story about Solomon that's it's, it's nowhere near as honorable. And it's the story of Solomon and one of his wives or concubines. Because it is said that Solomon had a lot of wives. He had a lot of concubines in the Old Testament. And that one of them was an idolatress. She worshipped idols. And through her relationship to Solomon, she enticed him to worship these idols along with her. And he gave in and began to worship idols. Solomon began to worship idols along with this woman. He became an idol worshiper. Now this was a real problem for me. And it goes not only to the point of credibility of the individual, but to the root of the whole theology of prophets. I mean, Solomon was sent by God to establish the law of Moses upon the children of Israel. And the greatest of that law is that thou shalt have no other God before me. This is the greatest of the law. As stated in the Old Testament, as stated by Jesus himself, the greatest of the law is that your Lord is your Lord, your God is one. And you should have no other God before me. And I am a jealous God, so on and so forth. So now I have God's prophet here worshiping something other than God. So my question became a conundrum. My question was, were not the children of Israel commanded to obey their prophets? We see this many times that they're commanded to obey the prophets of God. The prophets of God are given authority over the people by God Himself. Especially when we're talking about God's chosen people, the children of Israel. Yes. This was the answer. Yes, they were commanded to obey. I said, okay, so now would they be wrong or right if they followed Solomon in worshiping these idols? Would they be wrong? Could God punish them? They are breaking the greatest of the commandments to worship something other than God, but yet they are obeying God's commandment and following His prophets. So would they be right or would they be wrong? What should they do? Should they disobey Him and obey God, or should they, you know, obey Him and disobey God? You know, I mean, I mean, there's there's no real two ways to work it out. And I was told that this is you know really kind of a silly question first and foremost because of the simple fact that well I'll get to that in a moment after David, but I'll tell you the answer in a moment. But I had this. This is a problem. God's prophet worshiping idols. What if someone died while they were obeying Solomon or watching him worship these idols and they went along with it? Of course, it is stated that God sent a severe punishment upon Solomon, his kingdom was separated, so on and so forth. There, there was some punishment that came. But that's still a problematic for me because of the fact that you have now a person sent by God to teach people his way of life, breaking the very founding principle of the way of life itself that God is one. So I, I go down to the story of David, which is my last story of the Old Testament that we're going to go through. And we know the story of David and Goliath. It's a very famous story. David slaying the giant Goliath 
in, in, in the Quran, we have the same story done with our students. Beautiful story, even from the Bible. I mean, amazing story. The way, just just the, the honor and dignity that David had when he spoke with Goliath. Uh, it was just amazing. Um, and of course, David is attributed to writing the Psalms, uh, or most of them. No biblical scholar would say that okay, you know, David wrote every single one of them. There's no authority to back most of that up. But there's a story about David that prompted, apparently, a lot of, quite a few of the Psalms. Um, that is a story that's nowhere near as honorable as King David and his slaying of Goliath as a, as a boy. And it's the story of a woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba was a woman that was known for her beauty. She was gorgeous. And David saw this woman one day and decided this woman was so beautiful that he had to have this woman. So he went and he slept with her. The only problem with that is that Bathsheba is married. So is David, by the way. <clears throat> and Bathsheba's husband happens to be a commander in one of the brigades of his army named Uriah. So David has just committed the sin of adultery, which is punishable by death, according to the law of Moses. The punishment of adultery in the law of Moses is death by stoning. So he's just committed this sin. Now, David realizes that he has done wrong. He feels the remorse for it. Great remorse. Even some of the songs we read are talking about this remorse. I mean, they're just like you know, someone who's just completely broken. Completely broken. But I have a problem with this because it does not match with the actions that David took after realizing he had done wrong with sleeping with Bathsheba. He did not repent to God immediately and decide to fix you know, himself or take the punishment, which would have been the retribution. Take the punishment, which is death. God's prophet, by the way. He decides to write a letter to his army and say that when the battle is fierce, I want you to abandon Uriah so that Uriah dies. And they did this. They abandoned Uriah on the battle, on the battlefield, and he was killed. So now David is able to have that shame, and no one can say anything. Now this doesn't sound so remorseful now. So David covers up the sin of adultery by committing murder, or conspiracy to commit murder, however technical you want to get, but the law of murder is murder. If you are the, uh, the direct consequence of murder, you're a murderer. So David covered up adultery with murder. Now, I, I really have to just stop for a moment now in my life and say, wait a minute, this is just really, really, really out of hand. I mean, this is just going way past the point of credibility. I mean, we were at credibility with no one. Now we have gone to the point of blatant uh, disrespect for God's law, blatant flagrant disrespect for God's law. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, David is breaking, I mean, Solomon is breaking the first commandment, thou shalt have no other God before me. Solomon broke that. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. David is breaking that. Thou shalt not kill. David broke that. <laughs> You know, I mean, I'm sure somewhere there's somewhere that says don't sleep with your daughters in the law of Moses. I'm sure somewhere that's a problem. So this is really getting beyond now. I really have a problem with God's prophets. Now, I understood the concept that, that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as, as writes the author of Romans. I understand the concept. I mean, I, I'm, I'm grasping the concept that all have sinned and falling short of the glory of God. I knew that the reason why God had to send Jesus Christ or himself, why he had to pay the ultimate sacrifice was because the law was not able to bring us to that per perfection, that salvation, and that redemption under the law. So, but the point is that this is a little too much. I mean, if you wanted to get that point home, we didn't have to go this far with it. So I'm asking my pastor, and I'm asking the other young life pastors, and I even had the chance to talk to uh, Benny Hinn. I don't know if Benny Hinn is well known here in, in, in the UK. Um, and I was told all the same thing, that don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. For you are not justified by knowledge, you are justified by faith. And it is that faith unto the shedding of blood for the redemption of sins that God gave us a gift through His Son, Jesus Christ, which leads you unto justification. As Paul writes, that the law cannot lead one to justification. This is why the law had to be removed. The law had to go because the law was corrupt in itself. The law could not 
take one to that level of perfection. We even see that throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. That the law and God's salvation almost came to a contradictory level. That one could not bring you to the other. That's why Jesus Christ had to come and had to share his blood as that gift to remove us from us. As Paul writes that Christ was crucified as a curse under the law to remove us from the curse of the law. For it is written, everything made the tree is cursed. We'll get to that verse in just a moment. You know, but this rose a couple of more questions in my mind before we get to the New Testament and then we get on with it. This rose a couple more questions in my mind was that God did not know when sending the law that the law would not lead one to justification. Was this outside of the realm of God's knowledge? He didn't know that this was not going to be a workable solution. You're telling me that God learned something along the way? You know, this was just... God is omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he knows everything. So for him to send something that he knows is not going to work, just does not, does not really rationally with my understanding of the creator of all that exists and the God that I see from the Old Testament. Because one thing that was clear to me, if nothing was clear to me about the Old Testament, was a few things. Number one, who God was. No question about this. There is no ambiguity about this throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. God is one. This is the overwhelming, most reiterated fact of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. This is the greatest of the commandments. I am the Lord your God. There is none else. We see in Daniel and Isaiah, I am the Lord your God. There is none like me. And we can see in Isaiah, God asks, is there any like me that you can compare to me? So that you can have me for worship. Is there anything like me? God reiterates that fact. And the oneness for God is such a a unique oneness that the word in Hebrew does not connote one in numbers. The word for one in Hebrew that is used for God is a unique oneness. A unique oneness. It's not the number one. You don't see God saying, I, the Lord your God, am one in numbers. That's not the word that's used. And for the understanding of my Muslim brothers and sisters, we have the exact same connotation in the Arabic, which the languages are very similar. So that's why it's understandable. What is the Arabic word for one? Just one number. Wahid, right? And if you take Wahid and add it to Wahid, you get Ithnayn, you get two. One and one equal two. Now, what do we refer to God as one as? Ahad. Ahad. Now, if you take Ahad and add it to Ahad, what do you get? You can't. It's, it's, it's linguistically impossible. Because the Ahad signifies that there is one with no two. That God is one without a second. He is one without a second being able to be added to him. And this is the oneness of God we see from the Old Testament. One that a second cannot be added. Not only is it understandably impossible in the Old Testament, it is linguistically impossible. Even according to the language, you can't do it. And we see this the same in the Arabic. But this was God in the Old Testament, one, without a partner. I got this. One without two. And um, another thing very clear about the Old Testament was what God wanted from human beings. Was he wanted their worship? He wanted them to worship nothing else except but him. Nothing. They wanted them to worship him. They wanted them to sacrifice to him. They wanted everything that would be considered any form of worship to be directed towards God. And none else. And the third thing was that God wanted to be obeyed. He wanted obedience. He wanted you to obey him. What he said to do, you did it. And if you didn't do it, it was punishment. And what he said to stay away from, you stay away from it. And if you didn't, it would be punishment. And this was the very simplistic understanding of God and his relation to human beings in the Old Testament. And that if you wanted salvation from the Old Testament, if you wanted to, say, to be saved or justified or whatever have you, then when you commit a sin against God or His law, you repent. You repent. You turn to God and you say, I'm sorry, I ask for forgiveness, I have wronged you and wronged myself. And then you offer up whatever God had asked for, the sacrifices and the burnt offerings or whatever, which was not the physical thing that God wanted. He wanted the commitment and the dedication. And He said, do that and I will forgive you. I, I will forgive you. This was the God of the Old Testament. So, I have a big conundrum now between between the image I'm getting of God of Old Testament and the image of God prophets, God's prophets. I mean, I, and, and that God would send a law that he knew was flawed and that the system would not work. This is why we had to go from the Old Covenant to the New. I mean, it's just something here did not click. It was like trying to put a round peg into a square hole. It just, there's it, it, something not right here. 
So